Hey everyone, in this video we're going to go through a derivation of the wave equation including damping and forcing in the case of small displacements on a string. So we've got a diagram on the top left showing what's going on here, uh, setting up the coordinate system so the x-coordinate runs along the length of the string from left to right, right, so that dashed line in the diagram shows the undisturbed version of the string, and we've got the y-coordinate perpendicular to that which is measuring the transverse displacement of a particular element of the string. And our goal is to find the equation, the differential equation, that governs how y behaves, both as a function of position x and also as a function of time. So I'm just going to write below y that that y is really a function of both x and t for time. So let's think about what properties or what parameters of the string are going to affect the way in which waves propagate along it. Now, one of those properties is going to be how heavy it is. Um, basically because a string with more inertia is going to make it harder for waves to move move across it right now the best way to express that is in terms of a linear density in other words a mass per unit length which i'm going to give the symbol rho to so i'll just note that down there and another important parameter is the tension in the string which i'm going to call t this is relevant because well intuitively you would expect that if there's more force within the string it's going to be easier for neighboring parts of the string to sort of communicate information between each other and that should make it easier for waves to propagate along. Now, throughout this derivation, we're going to uh, assume that the tension is constant throughout the string. So we're also going to allow for the possible application of external forces to the string. Uh, that could be something as simple as gravity, or it could be something more complicated, like um, a force applied by a vibration generator at one end of the string or something like that. But in general, we're going to parameterize it um, as an applied force per unit length of capital F, and that can be a function of both x and time t, right? So because I'm defining this to be a force per unit length, that could have units of newtons per meter, for example. We also want to include the effect of damping, um, in other words, sort of resistive forces acting on the string. Uh, so we're going to say that there's a resistive force per unit length acting on the string, um, which is proportional to the transverse velocity of the string, right, of a particular element of the string. So the transverse velocity would be the partial derivative of y with respect to time. We're going to put a minus sign here because that's a resistive force, so it's always opposing the motion of the string, and we need some constant of proportionality there, which I'm going to call b. So we have a resistive force per unit length of minus b dy by dt, which itself is a function of x and t, because y is a function of x and t as well. So we've now set up all the parameters we need in order to actually derive the wave equation. And the way to do that is to zoom in on one little element of the string and consider how it's moving. So if I just draw a box uh, on the diagram at the top to show that we're focusing on that particular element of the string in there, and draw a diagram of that string element, we're going to consider all the forces that are acting on it. Okay. Now, keep in mind throughout this whole derivation, we're assuming that the displacements are small, um, which in turn means that this, the curvature of uh, the shape of the wave is not particularly uh, strong, right? So I'm kind of exaggerating the curvature in my diagram just to make it easier to draw and to see where all the forces are acting, but just keep in mind that we're assuming mathematically that the displacements are small. Um, and so, well, let's draw all the forces that are acting on this string element. We've got a tension, which is always acting along the string, so you've got tension T pulling in that direction, and the same, under the assumption of constant tension, you've got the same tension pulling down on the other end as well, but it's acting in a slightly different direction uh, because the string is, is curved. Now for our derivation, it's not just the tension which is acting, but you also have the applied force and the resistive force, right? So the applied force, let me draw that acting in the upwards direction and label that as F, well, let's just call it F, and we've got to multiply it by dx, which is going to be the length, the, the sort of horizontal extent of that string element. So that's going to be dx, right? The d simply means that it's an infinitesimally small quantity. So the uh, the force acting on that element, if it's got length dx, is just f times dx. And you've also got a resistive force. I'm going to draw that also acting in the upwards direction, which we said was minus b dy by dt per unit length. And so resistive force acting on this element in total is minus b y dot, I'm just using shorthand notation dot for a time derivative. Again, I have to times it by dx because it was a resistive force per unit length. Now notice that I've drawn both of those arrows in the upwards direction. In reality, they are both going to be, in general, they, they could be 
um, sometimes pointing upwards and sometimes pointing downwards, right? But if we want all of our signs to come out consistently, we've got to draw them on in the positive direction, which I originally defined to be the upwards direction in my uh, diagram at the top. Now that we've got our nice diagram showing all the forces acting on our string element, we can apply Newton's second law to that element. Okay, so Newton's second law in general, let me just write out uh, N2L, Newton's second law, it says the sum of all the forces on an object, sigma i of fi, right, where i just enumerates all the forces, uh, it's got to be equal to the object's mass multiplied by its acceleration. Okay, now the right hand side of that equation is a little bit easier to deal with in this case, so let's do that first. The mass of the string element is going to be approximately equal to rho dx. Remember rho is the linear density, dx is the horizontal extent of our string element. The reason for that is, well, we could call the vertical extent dy, right? So the vertical extent of our string element is dy. Then you could use Pythagoras to say that the, uh, the length of your string uh, element dl is approximately equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. But then if the displacements are small, then dy is going to be much smaller than dx. And so dl is roughly dx, okay? So the in words, basically all that's saying is that the string hasn't been stretched much from its equilibrium length. So its length is still approximately dx. Okay, so this is the mass of our string element. Then we have to multiply it by the acceleration. Now, because it's moving in a transverse sense, the acceleration is y double dot, which is the second time derivative of y with respect to time. Now, then we've got to add together all of the forces acting on this element. So you've got, well, the easy ones to deal with are f dx and minus by dot dx from our diagram. Those are easy because they're just acting in a vertical direction. Um, the tensions we've got to be a little bit more careful with, though, because they're not acting vertically. So we have to resolve them into components. Now, the way to do that is to think about the angle that both of those tensions are acting at. If I, let me add a little horizontal dashed line there and say that the angle between the far left part of the string element and the horizontal is theta. And then we've got another angle up here that our second tension makes with the horizontal. I'm gonna call that theta plus d theta. Now the, the reason for that notation is because if it's an infinitesimally small piece of string, those two angles are gonna be very similar, all right? So our second angle theta plus d theta is close to the first angle theta, but it's just changed by a little bit. And we're sticking with this notation of using d something um, to mean an infinitesimal change in that quantity. So we can then start resolving our tensions. If I extend my horizontal line over to the far left there, you can use vertically opposite angles to say that there's a theta down there as well. And so um, you've got your tension acting upwards on the far right which gives you a plus t times sine of theta plus d theta. And then this tension down here um, is going to get a minus sign because it's acting downwards. So that's minus t sine of theta. Now here's where we're going to use our small displacement approximation uh, to deal with these sine terms. So if the displacements y are small, then that means the curvature of the string is small and therefore all of the angles theta are small as well. So the small angle approximation for sine says that sine of theta is roughly equal to theta itself, right, when they're measured in radians. And so, well, the t sine of theta plus d theta becomes roughly t times theta plus d theta. The t sine theta becomes just roughly t theta. And so when you subtract those, you're just left with the t d theta part. Right, so uh, if we write out our new equation, it's rho dx y double dot is f dx minus b y dot dx. But now all of that stuff at the end just simplifies to plus t d theta. Now notice that each of the terms in this equation contains a differential or infinitesimally small quantity. Most of them contain a dx, 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 dx. This one has a d theta, but nonetheless, a sensible thing to do uh, would be to divide through by dx, okay? Now, that's going to mean your left-hand side is now just y double dot. You get f minus b y dot, because dx is cancel. Now, because these are infinitesimally small quantities, as we take the, the limit, as all your differentials go to zero, the final term is going to become a derivative, right? So it's t 
d theta by dx. I'm writing that as a partial derivative because this whole situation is changing in time as well. Now this is almost what we want because it is a differential equation, it's a partial differential equation. The only uh, inconvenient thing at the moment is this, the presence of this theta, right? We want to know how y changes with x and t, but we've got this additional variable theta. Fortunately, we can use the small angle approximation again um, to eliminate that theta. Okay, so I'm going to say, but the way to do this is to know that we've already said theta is roughly sine theta, but in the small angle approximation, theta is also roughly tan theta. Okay, now if you think of the, uh, go back to the zoomed in diagram on the far left, tan theta is roughly dy by dx, right? If you think of your string element as being the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle, that just follows from, uh, from trigonometry. Okay, so tan theta is roughly dy by dx. So we can write that in again, should be a partial derivative because all of these quantities are changing with time as well. So the t d theta by dx term is t times d by dx of this. And so you get a second spatial derivative of y. Okay, so d theta by dx is approximately equal to, let's write it approximately equal to uh, d2y by dx squared. At this point, we're basically done. I'm just going to write out my wave equation in a final form um, in full and just tidy it up a little bit to find some new parameters. So the way I'm going to write it is d2y by dt squared. That's coming from the y double dot on the left. Okay, I've divided everything by rho. Um, my next term, I'm going to move most of these terms over to the left-hand side. I'm going to get uh, something called gamma times dy by dt, where gamma I've just defined to be b over rho. Okay, you could write it out as b over rho, but just convenient to put that all together in one parameter. And then I'm going to move from your second spatial derivative term, I'm going to write that as minus some constant, which I'm going to call c squared times dy by dx squared, where if you think about it, well, c squared must have come from this t for tension and we divided everything by rho. So c squared is going to be t over rho. Now, if you haven't seen this before, it might seem a little bit mysterious as to why I'm putting a squared here, right, rather than just a c. The reason is basically that it's going to make solving the equation much more convenient and that c itself has a particular interpretation as the speed of waves on the string, right? So I'll cover that in a few videos time, but for now, uh, this is just the definition of c, right? It's the square root of t over rho. Now, I'm going to leave my forcing term on the other side. You're going to get f. Let's put in the, the x and t dependence, f of x and t divided by rho. And so there's your complete uh, wave equation, uh, including damping and forcing. So I'll, we're going to make a couple, of, uh, a couple of other videos in which I talk through how to solve this uh, in certain contexts. So I hope to see you again soon.